lecture will focus on transfer functions, poles, and zeros. Students should be reading chapter six of the course notes. At the conclusion of this lecture, students should be able to define the transfer function of a system, calculate the transfer function of a system, find the poles and zeros of a system, and use them to determine if the system is stable. The transfer function of a system is defined as the S domain ratio of the Laplace transform of the output response to the Laplace transform of the input or source. To find the transfer function of a system, all of the initial conditions must be zero, and the transfer function is defined to be h of s equal to y of s over x of s. Notice that h of s is the Laplace transform of the impulse response h of t. And the block diagram looks very similar, where the input is x of s, we use the transfer function to represent the system, and the output is y of s. Recall that in the time domain, the output of the system is found from the convolution, y of t equal to h of t convolved with x of t. In the frequency domain, the system output is found from the product, y of s is equal to h of s times x of s. So the benefit of moving from the time domain to the frequency domain is the fact that we can now use algebra and multiplication to solve these systems. Let's look at an example. Find the transfer function for the following RC circuit. The first thing we do is we redraw the circuit in the frequency domain. The input is VI of S. The impedance of the capacitor is one over SC. And the impedance of the resistor is R. And the voltage across the resistor is V naught of S. So we're using the voltage divider, H of S is equal to V naught of S over VI of S, which equals R over R plus one over SC, which can also be written as SCR divided by SCR plus one. Remember we assume zero initial conditions for the circuit to find the transfer function, so there are no initial voltages for the capacitor. What is the transfer function V naught of S over I of S for the following circuit? We're going to actually use KCL in order to find the answer for this one. The current coming into that top node would be in the frequency domain, I of S, and that's equal to the current through each of the elements, the resistor, the capacitor, and the inductor. Remember, the resistance in the frequency domain for a resistor is R. The impedance is one over SC for the capacitor, and the impedance is SL for the inductor. So I of S is equal to V naught of S over R plus SC times V naught of S plus V naught of S over SL. So the transfer function H of S is equal to V naught of S over I of S would be equal to one over one over R plus SC plus one over SL and doing a little bit of algebraic manipulation, we get that the transfer function is SLR over S squared LRC plus SL plus R. How about we find the transfer function for the following circuit? The first thing we'll do is we will redraw this circuit in the frequency domain. It's an inverting amplifier, so in the frequency domain, the input is VI of S, and we'll have 5,000 for the resistor, and we're going to have S times 0 0.5 for the inductor. Then we have the positive terminal tied to ground. The feedback resistor is 15,000, and the output is V naught of S. And since it's an inverting amplifier, H of S equal to V naught of S over VI of S is equal to negative the feedback impedance over the input impedance. So it's going to be negative 15,000 over 5,000 plus S 0 0.5. And if we divide out the 0 0.5 to get rid of the decimal, we'll have negative 30,000 over S plus 10,000. What is the transfer function V naught of S over VI of S for the following circuit? So the first thing we're going to do is to redraw this circuit in the frequency domain. So the voltage source is VI of S 
The inductor is S. The capacitor is 1 over S. And the resistor is 2. And the output voltage is V naught of S. So we're actually going to use KCL at the node V naught of S in order to find the transfer function. So we have the current through the inductor is VI of S minus V naught of S over S. And that equals the current through the capacitor, S, V naught of S, plus the current through the, in, the resistor, V naught of S over 2. So on the left-hand side, we have VI of S over S, and that equals V naught of S times the quantity 1 over S plus S plus 1 half. So the transfer function, H of S, equal to V naught of S over VI of S, is equal to 1 over 1 plus s squared plus s over 2 which equals 2 over 2s squared plus s plus 2. Poles zeros and pole zero plot on the s plane. H of s is always a rational function of s. H of s is equal to the numerator function of s divided by the denominator function of s and can be written in the form a times s minus z1 times s minus z2 and so on divided by s minus p1 times s minus p2 and so on. The zeros of h of s are the roots of the numerator. The poles of h of s are the roots of the denominator. If the order of the denominator is greater than or equal to the order of the numerator, then h of s is said to be a proper transfer function. If the order of the denominator is greater than the order of the numerator, then h of s is a strictly proper transfer function. If there are any complex poles, they always appear in conjugate pairs. The poles of h of s must lie in the left half plane of the s plane if the response is to be bounded or asymptotically stable. The zeros may lie in either the right half or the left half of the s plane. To determine system sta stability using the poles, you use the following three criteria. If all of the poles are in the open left half plane, the system is stable. If all of the poles are in the left half plane, including the imaginary axis, and no more than one at the origin, the system is marginally stable. If any of the poles of a transfer function are in the right half plane, the system is unstable. In order to quickly identify the system response, you can plot the poles and zeros on a pole zero plot or the S plane where the horizontal axis is sigma or the real axis and the vertical axis is the imaginary axis or J omega. On the S plane, the real axis and the vertical axis are used to plot all the poles and zeros. Poles are indicated with an X and the zeros are represented with an O. Remember, if any of the poles are in the right half plane of the S plane, then we have an unstable system. If the poles are on the imaginary axis and no more than one at the origin, it's marginally stable. And if all of the poles are in the open left half plane, then you have a stable system. Recall for a second order system, you can also plot the poles and determine the type of response you have. If there are two distinct real poles, the system is overdamped. If there are two complex conjugate poles, the system is underdamped. If there are repeated real poles, then the system is critically damped. And if there are two imaginary conjugate poles, the system is undamped. Therefore, the frequency domain poles can be related to the time domain response as well. In class activity five, plot the poles and zeros of the system represented by the following transfer function on the pole zero plot and determine if it is stable, unstable, or marginally stable. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to factor the numerator and denominator. The numerator factors into s plus 2 and s plus 1. The denominator factors into s squared times s plus 3. So we have zeros at negative 1 and negative 2. And we have poles at 0, and it's a repeated pole at 0, and negative 3. So I mark the horizontal or the real axis as sigma and the vertical axis or the imaginary axis is j omega. And I put a zero at negative one 
and I put a zero at negative two. I put two poles at the origin, which is zero, and I put a pole at negative three. Because I have the repeated pole at the origin, and that's more than one, we say that this system is unstable. Let's try another one. H of s is equal to s squared plus 2s plus 2 divided by s to the fourth power plus 5s cubed plus 17s squared plus 13s. So as before, the first thing we're going to do is factor the numerator and denominator. The numerator factors into s plus 1 plus j times s plus 1 minus j. The denominator factors into s times s plus 1 times s plus 2 plus j3 times s plus 2 minus j3. And then we're going to plot this on the pole 0 plane or the s plane. Here's my horizontal axis, which is the real axis sigma. Here's the vertical axis, which is the imaginary axis j omega. And when I plot the zeros, I have one zero at negative one plus j, which is here. And I have another zero at negative one minus j, which is here. And then I have a pole at the origin, a pole at negative one, and I have a pole at negative two plus j3, and a pole at negative two minus j3. And since I only have one at the origin, I say that this system is marginally stable. In class activity six, use the poles to determine if the following second order systems represented by the following transfer functions are stable. If it is stable, what type of response does it have? So the first one is h of s is equal to five over s squared plus two s plus one. That can be written at, rewritten as five over s plus one squared. So we have two poles at negative one. So we have a repeated real root. And recall, when you have a repeated real root, we say that we have a critically damped response. Since both of the poles are in the open left half plane, it's obviously also stable. And here are our two roots at negative one. Our second example is h of s is equal to 3s plus 12 over s squared plus 5s plus 6. If we factor the numerator and denominator, we get 3 times s plus 4 over s plus 2 times s plus 3. So if I draw the pole plot again, remember the zeros don't matter for determining the type of response or stability. So we're going to have a pole at negative two and a pole at negative three. And since we have two distinct real roots in the open left half plane, we do have a stable system and we say that it is overdamped. And the final example for today's lecture, h of s is equal to 8s squared plus 24s divided by 2s squared plus 10s plus 18. When we factor the numerator, it factors into 8s times s plus 3. And the denominator factors into 2 times s plus 2.5 plus j 1.66 times s plus 2.5 minus j 1.66. So when I graph this on my plot, here's my horizontal axis, the real axis, and here's the vertical axis or the imaginary axis. So we have negative two plus J 1.66, which is somewhere between one and two. So I have a pole here and then negative two minus J 1.66, which is approximately here. Now, once again, I have one pair of poles in this complex conjugate. They are in the open left half plane, so I do have a stable system, 
And because I have complex conjugate poles, we say that this system is under damped. And this concludes today's lecture on transfer functions and using the poles of transfer functions to determine stability and the type of response.